Good evening and welcome to the Review and Debates. My name is Akash and I serve as the President of the Club and I'm very proud to present our last debate of the semester. In March of 2015, Professor Andrew Ross, seated on my left, was barred from entering the UAE. The story was picked up by major news organizations such as Newsweek and the New York Times. They reported that this was because of criticism of labor practices that Professor Ross had made in the creation of NYU Abu Dhabi. More recently, NYU Professor Mohammed Bazi was also barred from entering the UAE, allegedly alleging racial and religious discrimination. Occurrences such as these have raised questions about whether or not the NYU Abu Dhabi campus upholds NYU's principles of academic freedom and its values. The question facing the House today, was the establishment of NYU Abu Dhabi a mistake? The format of today's debate is simple. Each speaker will present an 8 to 10 minute speech. At the 10 minute walk, I, I will signal to the speaker that the time is up by hitting the gavel once. After the four speeches, there will be a 15 minute question and answer session where the audience can ask questions to either side and the sides can also ask questions to each other. We ask the questions from the audience remain quick and to the point so that we have time to get as many as possible and please introduce yourself when you ask your question. Following the question and answer, both lead speakers will give four minute closing speeches with the opposition going first. We will poll the audience both before and after the debate. At this point, has everyone voted in their little ballots? We're going to collect them right now. Has everyone received a ballot? If you have not and you've come just after with that, get one from either Jenny right over there or Jennifer. Yeah, I was thinking the At this point, you can vote either for, against, or undecided, and another round of voting will happen in the end of the debate, with the final poll slips collected after the final closing speech. Immediately after the debate, the votes will be tallied, and the winner will be the team able to sway more people to their side. Uh, I would also like to announce that this event will be filmed, so if any of you are uncomfortable with that or do not want your voice or likeness, just don't step in front of the camera, other than that, all of you should be good. Introducing our debaters for today, speaking for the motion that NYU Abu Dhabi was a mistake is Professor Andrew Ross. Andrew Ross is a professor of social and cultural analysis at New York University. A contributor to The Guardian, The New York Times, The Nation, and Al Jazeera, he is the author of many books, including Credocracy and the Case for Debt Refusal, Birds of Fire, Lessons from the World's Least Sustainable City, Nice Work If You Can Get It, Life and Labor in Precarious Times, Fast Boat to China, Lessons from Shanghai, No Collar, The Humane Workplace and Its Hidden Costs, and the Celebration Chronicles, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Property Value in Disney's New Town. Most recently, he's the editor of The Gulf, High Culture, Hard Labor. Supporting Professor Ross is Sam Raskin. Sam Raskin is an NYU senior majoring in politics with a history minor. He is the co-editor-in-chief of NYU Local, NYU's independent blog, and Raskin has also reported for BuzzFeed News and Gotham Gazette. Ladies and gentlemen, you're a firm <laughs> is Professor Shamoon Zamir. Shamoon Zamir is Associate Professor of Literature and Visual Studies at NYU Abu Dhabi. He has been a serving faculty at NYU Abu Dhabi since its very inception and has served as Chair of Faculty Council Steering Committee, Associate Dean of Arts and Humanities, and Program Head for Art and Art History. He works in the areas of literature, photography, and intellectual history, and his study of the African-American writer W.E.B. Du Bois, explored literature's dialogues with philosophy and sociology, and his new book, The Gift of the Face, explores the relationship of aesthetics and ethics in the work of the early 20th century photographer Edward S. Curtis. Professor Zamir has an edition published on 20th century African American and Native American fiction and on modern poetry and has translated short stories from Urdu. He's the director of ACASA, Center of Photography at NYU Abu Dhabi. The center is developing a photographic archive and also a conference and exhibition series devoted to photography with a primary focus on the Middle East. Professor Zamir studied English and American literatures and American studies at the University of London and has taught at the Universities of Chicago, York University, and the University of London before his current appointment at NYU Abu Dhabi. Supporting Professor Zamir is Louis Bartholomew. He's a senior at CAS studying public policy and business studies. He's the co-director of the podcast committee of the Politics Society at NYU. And in his spare time, Louis enjoys rock climbing, playing piano, and debating about all things political. Ladies <laughs> and gentlemen, you're negative. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, 
thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm here to argue for the motion, although I feel it is above my pay level to do so. Um, there are many senior administrators here at NYU with large salaries who should be answering this question and whose job it has been for some years now to take care of the issues that we will be debating tonight. That said, I'm not going to shirk my duties. Uh, I'll start off in, in 2007 and say that um, uh, I believed in 2007 that NYU Abu Dhabi, when it was announced, was a mistake and it said so in my capacity as president of the NYU chapter of the AAUP. The AUP is a national organization that kind of invented academic freedom and acts as its steward and its watchdog. <coughs> Events that have occurred over the last 10 years have only reinforced my opinion and, and, the, and the opinions of many of our members. Uh, that said, my remarks this evening are not meant to disparage in any way uh, the students and the faculty currently at NYU Abu Dhabi. They deserve our full support and our efforts to protect their rights, and the AUP continues to do so. The question before us relates to 2007 mostly. Um, <coughs> Was it a mistake to undertake NYU Abu Dhabi in 2007? Given what we knew at that time about the human rights situation in the UAE, and given how likely it was that students and faculty there would become casualties of the human rights situation, <coughs> was it a mistake to undertake the venture? Um, I would say yes, and uh, the problem is that um, there's no one currently on NYU payroll who played a very key role in that decision. <coughs> it was almost entirely the brainchild of John Sexton. And faculty were not seriously consulted at the time. Students and alumni, forget about it. Trustees, I'm sure many of them were persuaded it was a, a decent business proposition and many senior administrators were persuaded it would be a big boost to the expansionist growth machine of NYU, which they were tasked with managing. Um, <coughs> however, primarily John Sexton's decision and one of the unilateral decisions that he made that led ultimately to faculty votes of no confidence in his administration here in no, no fewer than five schools at NYU. Faculty votes of no confidence are not taken lightly. They are initiatives of last resort, and they usually are intended to communicate that universities are not organizations which have an executive decision-making class on top calling all the shots, but rather that universities are complex communities with many components and overlapping interests and are guided by canons of shared governance, shared governance in which students and trustees and administration and faculty all have roles to play. And it was during the years of the Sexton administration that shared governance was rapidly eroded. And unfortunately, NYU Abu Dhabi became exhibit A of what happens when you distribute power upwards concentrate it in an executive decision-making class. Now, after the decision was announced, we, uh, we predicted that there would be violations of the university's ethics in two main areas, one academic freedom and one in the area of labor rights and human rights. In the case of the first, it wasn't a matter of if, but when. And to date, there have been several faculty and students who have been barred entry to the UAE, as you probably know, for reasons of research or because of their ethnic background. And several more you haven't heard about because they haven't been publicized. And many more that have been averted because of, probably because of heavy duty self-censorship. In the case of labor rights, <coughs> the, the Faculty Student Coalition for Fair Labor here in campus worked very long and hard to try and ensure that there would be fair labor standards in, in Abu Dhabi and the construction of the campus. We failed to persuade the administration to appoint an adequate labor monitor, however, and that labor monitor fell down on the job, and the result I'm sure many of you know about was widely publicized, and as a result, NYU's name is now associated with widespread uh, labor abuse and exploitation and workplace repression. In some cases, in my case, for example, these two areas were combined. I was doing labor research in Abu Dhabi labor camps when I was barred from entry 
As with Christina Bogos, student uh, studying journalism at NYU Abu Dhabi, and several of my artist colleagues from the Gulf Labor Coalition, which is focused on the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi. Um, the upshot really is that the Abu Dhabi authorities are now effectively in a position to determine what kind of research is permissible there and what is not. And obviously, labor research, research into labor conditions is not permissible. And demonstration of that, I, I would just point out that since uh, since the book I published a few years ago, uh, which was mentioned at the beginning, the by culture hard labor was published. There have been no published accounts of labor conditions in Abu Dhabi. There's been research, but nothing published. Now, I will say that Abu Dhabi is not the only GNU site where there are serious problems regarding access, and where information, where freedom, uh, speech and research are also threatened. Shanghai and Tel Aviv are probably the other two sites that are often put on that list. These three cities happen to be places I have done labor research myself. I know them quite well. Um, and uh, for folks in Abu Dhabi who say that it's, it's, un it's uh, unfair that Abu Dhabi is often singled out here at NYU on the square, I agree fundamentally with that, uh, with that standpoint. And I do believe, for example, that with respect to uh, NYU Tel Aviv, where there are particular problems for students of Palestinian descent to be able to go there from NYU, uh, where there are openly discriminatory policies of access, we should be debating in forums like this uh, the ethics of NYU Tel Aviv and, and asking ourselves why there is not more discussion about that issue on this campus. To get back to the motion, however, which is Abu Dhabi specific, um, <coughs> let me say that uh, one of the most consistent arguments that has been made uh, by advocates of NYU Abu Dhabi from the very beginning was that our presence in such an illiberal society would help to promote the habits of free inquiry and freer speech. Now, leaving aside the strong odor of colonial paternalism that attaches itself to that assumption, I would direct you to look at the annual reports of Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, and they would show quite clearly that the human rights record in the UAE has been deteriorating quite steadily over the last several years. In that very same period where you would expect to see signs of liberalization as a result of the presence of institutions, liberal institutions like our own, we have seen exactly the opposite. You could make the same argument in China, where there's been a, a, a crackdown on speech and heavy state intervention into universities that's been intensifying over these same years. And you could make the same argument with respect to Israel where the crackdown on the speech and, and dissenting views of Israeli citizens has been intensifying, not to mention the, um, the Palestinian populations under military occupation. Um, in Abu Dhabi, however, or in the UAE, let's say, uh, the, only, um, the only Emiratis who are brave enough to openly advocate for human rights were handed long prison sentences earlier this year. I speak of Nasser ben Gay and Ahmad Mansour. They are behind bars right now with no prospect of release anytime soon. And so in response to uh, that record, the AUP here continues to push for stronger protections. Uh, uh, departments and schools here on the square are passing resolutions uh, insisting that the university administration take stronger measures and the Coalition for Fair Labor continues its work in trying to secure adequate compensation for workers who were arrested, beaten and deported as a result of going on strike uh, on Saudi Island. So to conclude, uh, I want to come back to the motion which is very specific. Um, <coughs> Was John Saxon, could John Saxon have predicted these violations of university ethics back in 2007 when he signed the agreement contract? Yes, he could have done, if only he had listened to experts um, on his own faculty and elsewhere, experts in Middle Eastern studies, 
our academic freedom, our labor rights. Now John Stockson, unfortunately, was not a good listener. And as a result, <coughs> I don't think anyone would disagree with that who knew him or who was employed on his payroll at the time. Uh, but as a result, the, the agreement that he reached, the decision that he made, uh, has to be seen in retrospect as almost as autocratic as the government with whom he signed the agreement. So I want to say, just in concluding, that if you vote for this motion, and I urge you to do so, you are not voting in any uh, fashion to pull the plug in NYU Abu Dhabi. That is not the purpose of this motion. On the contrary, we must support our peers and our colleagues as much as we can. Uh, especially in light of the circumstances. However, I will say, your vote, if you vote for the motion, will have an impact far beyond this room. It will help to pressure our administrators to do the right thing, finally, by, its global camp by our global campuses, take a firm and unyielding stand on academic freedoms of all kinds, including the, the right to extramural speech, uh, they will, they, hopefully they will champion the kind of research that is impermissible or prohibited in illiberal societies. And in doing so, um, they will help to uh, restore NYU's reputation as a fine liberal institution with broad liberal values. Thank you. I'm going to counter-argue and try and persuade you that NYU Abu Dhabi was a mistake. Um, and I'm going to try and also counter-argue, I think, some of the excessively Gothic language that uh, Professor Ross has just used in terms of um, repression, casualties, human abuse, etc., which <coughs> confuses what happens in NYU Abu Dhabi and what happens in the UAE more broadly sometimes. The proposition for this debate is framed as a series of four questions, each of which suggests that NYU Abu Dhabi as a project has fallen short of the values academic as well as social that NYU espouses. Implicit in the questions, therefore, is the question of whether NYU Abu Dhabi should ever have been started in the first place, and I suppose, therefore, equally, the question of if and how NYU as a project, NYU Abu Dhabi as a project, should be continued, and what relationship it should have to the mothership of the square. I will, of course, argue uh, against the proposition and will try and answer these questions. But before I do so, I want to point out that the questions that frame this debate establish a game that must be played with loaded dice. And the dice are very much loaded in advance against NYU Abu Dhabi. I know that Professor Ross has addressed it, but I want to do want to make this point, that to isolate NYU Abu Dhabi from the rest of the GNU as the questions do, is to imply that the concerns about the threat to liberal values is somehow unique to NYU Abu Dhabi. One would have to ask, of course, why not Shanghai or Tel Aviv, but I would extend that and ask why not New York itself. Uh, and I ask this question as somebody who was born in Pakistan, grew up in England, has lived in France and all over the world, and for the eight, last eight years in Abu Dhabi. I raise these comparisons not in order to deflect attention from the failings of NYU Abu Dhabi, and there are failings of NYU Abu Dhabi, as there are every institution, but to point out that in shorthand form, the crisis of liberal values is unfortunately at present a global one, and the relationship of pedagogy and research to these, this crisis requires a truly complex and nuanced level of reflection and examination. Setting up a straw man called NYU Abu Dhabi and easily knocking it down is not the answer. Setting up a stark opposition between a self-confident moral and ideological rectitude on the one hand and moral and ideological failings, irresponsibility, or even corruption on the other is, I think, to simplify the situation. It is potentially to undermine the sense of dialogue and careful passing of evidence by which we all define ourselves as scholars, intellectuals, and responsible global citizens. The present is not a time to build borders and walls, it is a time to knock them down. The UAE, in case 
you don't have this information, I want to give you some background information. It's a federation of seven emirates. Dubai is the best known, but Abu Dhabi is the largest and the richest. Its population is 8 million, 9 million people, roughly, only 11% of whom are Emiratis. The rest are Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshi, Sri Lankans, Filipinos, Americans, Europeans, and many other nationalities. NYU Abu Dhabi, as a teaching school, opened its doors in 2010. It was based on an agreement between NYU and the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi. It is a unique venture in the Gulf because it is a fully independent university with four divisions. Um, it is dedicated, surprisingly, in a combination to both a liberal arts education and a serious research agenda. It is fully funded by Abu Dhabi. One of the misconceptions about NYU Abu Dhabi is that the money comes from New York to Abu Dhabi. It's actually the other way around. Um, the student body is made up of roughly 15% Emiratis, 15% Americans, and the rest are from all over the world. Currently, about 119 nationalities are represented um, on the campus. So the question of academic freedom. The AAUP defines academic freedom, as I understand it, as a contract between institution and faculty, and not between a government and individual faculty. And its primary and clearest emphasis is on freedom to teach and research without constraints. Both of these criteria are fully met at NYU Abu Dhabi, and as far as I am aware, there are no restrictions placed upon what we teach and what we research or what the students teach or research in Abu Dhabi. Recently, two tenured faculty from NYU were invited to teach at NYU Abu Dhabi and were denied security clearance and visas. And that particular occurrence has partly prompted the kind of debate we are currently engaged in. There is absolutely no question that this was a deeply regrettable occurrence and a challenge for NYU Abu Dhabi's educational mission. And I'm pretty certain that it is not inconceivable that similar situations may or could arise in the future. It is not, however, the case that NYU Abu Dhabi didn't do its utmost to try and reverse the decision or that the faculty took this sitting down. But it is important to be very clear and precise here. Global mobility is not the same thing as academic freedom. No university anywhere in the world can guarantee free movement across national borders for its faculty, including NYU on the square. The governments have the right to deny entry, regularly do so across the globe, including the USA. <coughs> and also, as far as the security clearance and visa issues is concerned, in, uh, in the sake, for the sake of passing evidence clearly, I think it is really important that unlike the way this debate has been framed, we distinguish very clearly between the denial of the visas for Professor Bazi and Kashavarian and the refusal of permission to board a plane for Professor Ross. Those are very, very different things, and one uh, and the other cannot be simply compared. To do so, I think, is to uh, muddy the waters about the exact precision with which we define academic freedom and also individual academic responsibility. Labor. When NYU Abu Dhabi was started, it worked with the local government to establish what were, by any criteria, fairly advanced and high levels of standards <coughs> for labor in the Gulf. There is also no question that when the uh, monitoring was done, it was revealed that on some level we had failed. However, the language of labor abuse, repression, etc., confuses things completely and misrepresents them. In case you're not aware, the failing was that a number of laborers working on the building of the campus at NYU Abu Dhabi fell outside the compliance regime. In other words, compliance was not conducted. And the most serious charge against NYU at that point was not repression or abuse, but that they weren't paid the salaries that were due. As soon as this was revealed, NYU Abu Dhabi acknowledged its failings it worked with the Abu Dhabi government to set up an extremely expensive and extensive exercise to recompensate these workers. And to date, in a unique exercise in the Gulf, something like 7,000 out of 10,000 workers have been compensated. No other institution or corporation in the history of the Gulf, as far as I'm aware, has ever done this. It is also important that you understand that the 10,000 out of 30,000 who fell out of compliance were largely short-term subcontractors who worked for a very short time on the campus. So the 10,000 gives you a very different kind of perspective. 
Following uh, the revelation, NYU Abu Dhabi has also established a new code of conduct for labor employment. And um, it has made clear that all future employees uh, working for NYU cannot be exempt from these standards. We have 700 workers working on the NYU campus who enjoy the, uh, the best salaries and the most uh, uh, generous benefits of uh, equivalent employment anywhere in the world. And I'm absolutely certain that if you were to poll them blindly tomorrow, every one of them would suggest that they would rather work at NYU than without it anywhere else. We have also provided educational programs for all 700 workers, uh, training programs in computing and languages, etc. Many of them have got promoted and moved on. We have also developed guidelines for domestic laborers, um, uh, which we uh, have pioneered at NYU Abu Dhabi. All in all, despite all the failings, I think it is fair to say that NYU Abu Dhabi has set standards that are unprecedented in the UAE as far as labor treatment is concerned. Lastly, but not least of all, we have created an extraordinary and unique global educational project. We have hundreds of students from hundreds of countries receiving an exceptionally high level of education. In many cases, they pay very little, and in most cases, they pay nothing at all. And these are many students who could not possibly have afforded this kind of education in any other circumstances. We have, therefore, together formed a remarkable community of exchange and dialogue which contributes to an extraordinary network of work, intellectual exchange, and friendship that exists now across the globe. As far as the notion of an <coughs> illiberal society is concerned, I have absolutely no doubt that in many respects, NYU Abu Dhabi is indeed an illiberal society. In many other ways that are less publicized, it is not. However, when I joined NYU Abu Dhabi in 2010, I was asked exactly this question as to why I was working for an illiberal society. And I pointed out in the Senate that I had had many qualms about working for a country which had undertaken illegal wars, killed hundreds of thousands of people, that allows its police to shoot minorities with impunity, that runs an illegal uh, detention camp called Guantanamo Bay, etc., etc., etc. If the proposition is that we cannot exist in a society with serious abuses, then I really have to ask the question how and why you can exist in the United States. I say this as somebody who's devoted his life out of a love for American culture and as my entire academic career. In conclusion then, to, to ask the question of whether NYU Abu Dhabi was a mistake or not, I think is a wrong one. What we need to ask instead is that in an imperfect world where there are <coughs> imperfect institutions, are the achievements of NYU Abu Dhabi such that they outweigh its failures? Whether these achievements help uphold the principles of NYU rather than undermine them? I would argue in both cases that their answer should be an unequivocal yes. In terms of our major research projects, in terms of our pedagogical efforts, in terms of our commitment to fair labor practices, in terms of our efforts to build a global network of like-minded scholars and citizens, I think NYU Abu Dhabi has without question done more to make this a better world than a worse one. And I think um, uh, to point out that we haven't yet seen a radical transformation of the UAE after the fact that we have existed for only seven years in that country um, is to me simply ridiculous. Thank you very much. In 2007, then President John Sexton sent a university wide email announcing New York University's plans to build a campus in the United Arab Emirates capital, financed entirely by its government. He promised that the NYU Abu Dhabi would be, quote, built with the academic quality and practices conforming to the standards as those of at NYU's Washington Square campus, including our standards of academic freedom. Since NYU Abu Dhabi opened for classes in 2010, the university has not come close to fulfilling this message. It has not come close to filling what Sexton said it would be. A campus located in a country whose government bars NYU professors <coughs> due to their religious sect or because of their political views is not one that fulfills academic freedom. Academic freedom is not just the ability to teach what you want in the classroom, but if people that are in the classroom are 
decided upon by the NYU by the Abu Dhabi government or by the UAE that is not academic freedom. In September, Professor Mohammed Bazi and Arankar Shaverzian, both from Shia, revealed they were scheduled to teach at NYU Abu Dhabi, but were denied security clearance due to the religious sect. In 2015, Andrew Ross was barred from the country and thus unable to conduct research at the campus because of his research on the, NYU's labor, on the UAE's labor practices. Last year, Egyptian doc student, doctoral student, rather, Alia El Husseini was denied a visa, which she says was a result of her support for the Arab Spring. And as Washington Square News reported last month, prior to 2012, Jewish and atheist academic advisors were instructed to lie about the religion so they would be able to teach at the university. The list goes on, and it will go on. Yet, despite all evidence to the contrary, NYU Abu Dhabi has frequently asked questions in section on its website maintains that it enjoys, quote, full academic freedom as it exists at NYU New York. Again, it does not. The university has refused to come to terms with the challenges to academic freedom at the Abu Dhabi campus. Similar similarly, university spokespeople have attempted to paint a picture in which these incidences Incidences are one-off events. These are aberrations, they claim, as the Abu Dhabi campus has students and professors of all faiths. By treating these as isolated rather than patterns, the university has swept its professors' concerns under the rug to preserve the viability of its precious global network university. Indeed, it has yet to make a public statement acknowledging that Bazi and Keshavarian were victims of sectarian discrimination. As of Sunday, they had yet to reach out to both professors. Regardless of what NYU's website or the spokespeople say, the UAE has shown no interest in allowing NYU to uphold its stated goals in NYU Abu Dhabi. In this respect, NYU Abu Dhabi has been a failure for the university. But what about for the UAE, the campus's benefactor? What do they get out of this arrangement? Do people spend money, or do countries spend money for no reason? What do they get out of this partnership? John Sexton, I think, was actually on the right track back in 2007. In his aforementioned announcement, the former NYU president explained the appeal of the university for the UAE. Quote, As many of you may know from recent press coverage, there is an enormous commitment by Abu Dhabi to make itself a cultural and intellectual center in the region, amply demonstrated by the important world institutions that, that, that are establishing themselves there, he wrote. This is not his imagination. Emirati government officials are not particularly shy about the strategy of branding themselves <coughs> as a Western-friendly, cosmopolitan institution or government because of the, cultural, of the cultural and edu educational institutions that they bring. The UA Minister of State, for instance, told the New York Times last month that the newly opened uh, uh, Louvre Abu Dhabi is part of their effort to gain, quote, soft power. He continued, it is no longer sufficient to have military economic power if you're not able to share your values. Exchange, this is what soft power is about. NYU willingly cooperates in this charm offensive. For example, in a New York Times letter to the editor responding to the NYU Journalism Department's decision to break ties with the campus, NYU Abu Dhabi Vice Chancellor Al Bloom tend to protect the campus's legitimacy. According to him, students and faculty in Abu Dhabi, quote, embrace the values of mutual respect, understanding, and inclusivity. Together, he continued, we have built an elite global university, one that enjoys the academic freedom, that has produced eight Rhodes Scholars in just four years, the highest number per student of any university in the world. I'm not sure how the Rhodes Scholars are relevant, but I'll continue. In essence, what the UAE receives is a boost in its brand from NYU. They're not funding the university out of sheer goodwill, or they're not, and they're not throwing, throwing money down the drain. Public relations is the return on investment. NYU cannot claim to be a bastion of academic freedom and a model for a global university while simultaneously providing what is in effect public relations services for the Emirati government. To be clear, I do not particularly care about NYU's reputation. I do not believe NYU Abu Dhabi should be evacuated tomorrow, nor do I mean to denigrate those that choose to teach and study at NYU Abu Dhabi, as Andrew said earlier. And I also do not believe the Abu Dhabi campus is the sole location that poses problems in the academic freedom realm. It's, it's not the only site where we have these issues. In fact, as policies uh, such as the travel ban and DACA show uh, of late, NYU on the square has its own set of challenges. Nevertheless, when those in the NYU community are threatened due to their United States policies, Hamilton is able to condemn them unequivocally and st stands by those affected, issuing countless statements to that effect on immigration and even taxes. When an NYU PhD student was detained at JFK after flying back from Iran, Hamilton promised to, quote, safeguard the rights, well-being, education, and scholarships of those affected by these or other changes to immigration policies. Again, he's understanding and stating what's happening. But when it comes to Abu Dhabi Portal Campus, 
the university has opted not to stand up to its values, or stand for its values, rather. Instead, it has justified and defended the right of the UAE to, to enact these dis discriminatory policies. While Hamilton called the recent visa denials, quote, very troubling, he failed to acknowledge the true nature of the problem. Worse, NYU spokespeople here in Abu Dhabi attempt to absolve the university from any responsibility or from taking any action to confront the problem at hand. They parrot the following line, both John Beckman and Kate Chandler in Abu Dhabi. While we continue to press for the free flow of scholars across our global network, we also recognize that in the US, it is, as in the US, it is the government that controls visa and immigration policy. This routine is not new. And I don't think anyone claims that NYU Abu Dhabi or NYU makes the immigration policy. That is refuting a point that I have not heard anyone make. In the 2011 faculty senate meeting, Sexton reportedly waved away professors' concern regarding the UAE's arrest of human rights activist Ahmed Mansour and four others. According to Human Rights Watch, he re responded by saying the UAE has, quote, genuine security concerns and, quote, a right to defend itself against security threats. Time and again, NYU's arrangement with the UAE has caused the university to shy away from standing for its values. Further, by dishonestly maintaining the standards of the Abu Dhabi campus are above board, board we cooperate in a deliberate campaign to mass, rep to mass repressive policies in the veneer of cultural and educational institutions. With NYU's blessing, the campus is used to provide an image boost and international clout to a government that does not come close to deserving either. One can not disentangle this fact from the, fa <coughs> the fact that the campus is bought and paid for by the Emirati government. Unlike NYU on the square, the, Abu da the UAE funds NYU Abu Dhabi. The US government does not fund NYU on the square. That is a distinction that has to be made. As President Sexton and Hampton, an NYU promotional video, or a particularly starry-eyed uh, NYU student will tell you, NYU's brand carries a lot of weight both domestically and abroad. NYU is America's largest private university, an elite academic institution, the greatest city in the world, attracting world-renowned professors from all fields, churning out countless influ influential alumni over the years. And they're all right. But as a result, NYU has a moral responsibility to exercise caution, especially since NYU wants to serve as a model for others. Due to its par partnership with the UAE, the university has created a situation where it can not only quickly stand by its professors and its students, and it can't stand, claim to stand by its mission either. NYU's hands, it has become clear, are tied behind its back to this partnership with the UAE. <coughs> it can't, or will not, perform the modest task of publicly acknowledging this professor who is subject to discrimination, as has been the case this fall. NYU has failed to accomplish its goals with, Abu Dhabi, with the Abu Dhabi portal campus. Whether or not the university wants to admit it, NYU Abu Dhabi is not in line with NYU's academic freedom goals. The, NYU, the Abu Dhabi campus is a prime example of NYU behaving unethically and lowering its standards with the goal of building a global network university. NYU Abu Dhabi, in short, was a mistake. just reiterate and clarify a few misconceptions about NYU Abu Dhabi. Uh, first of all, this the subject of visa denials. Um, as our opponents have said, they happen all over the world, uh, and they happen including in the U.S. Now, usually the policy of most governments is that they don't comment on the specific reason. Uh, so this is not a, a unique thing to the region. Uh, secondly, the NYU administration has about as much power over U.S. visa practices as they do over Abu Dhabi practices. Yes, we can we can complain about it here. We have the right to complain, and we don't over there necessarily. But it doesn't necessarily change the outcome. Um, the other thing, uh, with the specific example of religious discrimination or the claim of religious discrimination, is that again we have no proof of this. There are Shiite students and faculty teaching at NYU Abu Dhabi that. The narrative seems to be more leaning towards that there's, there's widespread religious discrimination, that there are no Shiite in the country. That's simply not true. Fourthly, uh, as, as uh, our opponents have alluded to, again, uh, their government, the Emirati government, pays for most of the education of the students on this campus. Uh, NYU is not paying more into N uh, NYU Abu Dhabi. It's, it's very much the other way around. Uh, I'm glad that they recognize that uh, the singling out of NYU Abu Dhabi is unfair. Uh, I've noticed this especially in China and Tel Aviv as well, 
where if you if you do criticize the Chinese government, uh, you shouldn't expect to teach in China. It's just goes with the goes with the territory, and you should know that. And we're not going to you know <coughs> complain too much about that, or we can complain, but we're not going to get anything out of that uh, complaint. Uh, and I, I also think it's interesting that the animosity towards John Sexton's project uh, is fueling, I think, a disproportionate response to this. Uh, I think there are a lot of valid reasons to be angry at John Sexton's way of going about creating these campuses and the global network itself, but I think that this might be a case where we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You know, the global network does have huge benefits. Maybe the way in which it was created by this man wasn't ideal. Maybe there wasn't enough input from faculty, students in the region, uh, but I don't think we should be throwing out the entire project because of how it was created. Uh, now, the other issue with human rights in the UAD uh, that our opponents bring up that the human rights issues within the country should have precluded any unilateral decision in its founding. Um, and again, though it was his brainchild, though it was Sexton's brainchild, the, ma the vast majority of students and faculty at NYU uh, AD, uh, they feel grateful and happy to be there. They, they love the opportunity to be studying in this country. There's no repression on this campus at all. It is a liberal university within a country that is repressive, you could argue. Um, going on to the other point, uh, they also, there was an implication from, our, from the pro camp that by taking a stand again, by Andy Hamilton taking a stand for, for these professors in this one instance, that he would have any uh, effect on the academic freedom uh, practice within the country. Uh, again, he doesn't have power to free anybody from JFK, m much less uh, NYU Abu Dhabi, or from any area within Abu Dhabi. So again, he has about as much power there as he has here. Uh, finally, I just want to reiterate the, the, the initial goal of NYU Abu Dhabi was, it, it was built with an active interest by the government, yes, but I think we have to be honest with why that was. So there was the implication that this was possibly having whiffs of a colonialistic enterprise, but again, colonialism is without the consent of the people there. This was with, in conjunction with the local government, they want us there. It's not as if we're going in without the consent of the people there. Uh, they want a liberal research university. They don't want a repressive uh, madrasa that is in the Western tradition. They want a liberal research university there. And as we've also noted, 15% of the students are Emiratis. So if this campus continues existing, we're going to note that in a, in a generation or two, NYU Abu Dhabi students are going to be filling the ranks of business, of government, within the Emirati state. And what's that going to do to the state uh, eventually? And do they, do they want the implications of that? So I think the implications of this are that those who graduate from NYU are go from NYU Abu Dhabi, they're going to this campus, their parents knowing that it is a liberal research university, they're gonna come out of that with uh, a greater understanding of uh, the Western tradition. They want to understand Western education more. They want to engage with people from all over the world. They don't want to just engage with people who are Emirati. They want to engage with an international student body and faculty and have exposure to all kinds of ideas, not just the ideas of the region, which I think is a great thing. The other, um, the other bonus that I see from this campus, the, the really good benefit that I think we need to be noting, is that there are many more female Emirati students who attend uh, disproportionately. Uh, and since otherwise they would be less likely to attend schools abroad, this is a really good opportunity for families to send their, uh, their daughters to a liberal university within the country. Um, otherwise they'd be, they'd be within the country not having that opportunity. So I think NYU Abu Dhabi actually serves a really important purpose on that front in promoting educational and professional opportunities for women within the country. For these reasons, uh, I believe that on balance the uh, NYU Abu Dhabi project and experiment has been a success. Yes, there are things that we need to address going forward, and we, we should, but I think on balance, uh, our interests in the region and their interests in the region are, are coming closer together, and that it is good on balance. Thank you. Thank you to all four of our speakers. At this point, we'll open it to questions. Again, please do introduce yourself, and if you want to direct to a specific side, please do so. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, just... Um,
Show me, we'll do both. So we'll take a question first, then we'll come to a response. Well, how about that? First? Okay, just, uh, hi, my name is, wait, what do I have to do, Lean? Your name and which side you want to Lean. Lean, um, I'm going to ask you, just sure. on this point that you just sure. made, about women in the Emirates. That really, really reeks of white men saving brown women from brown men. So can you address that? Because I, I'm, um, as a brown woman, I'm very offended right now. <laughs> um, well, what I meant by that is, so so what's the absence of NYU Abu Dhabi going to mean? It's going to mean that fewer women are going to be going to school. That's a fact. NYU Abu Dhabi's presence there means that uh, more women are going to be going to university. I'm not saying that they should. I'm not saying that we're, we're saving them. I'm saying that's just a fact. Uh, that's the effect that the college is having there. Um, I don't necessarily see the implication you're talking about. Maybe, maybe you can speak more to that. There's a general heavy investment in education across the board in the Emirates. I think the way Louis phrased it might have given the wrong impression. So at Mazda, which is a new um, environmentally alternative city that they're trying to build, there's an engineering school. And one of the surprising facts about the 400 students they've got doing engineering is that 34% of Emirati women. That's a local university. Zayed University has a very high proportion of <coughs> Emirati women. Uh, the simple point is not that there are in, I would take exception to the notion that white men are teaching brown women, because I teach there as well. Uh, <laughs> lots of other uh, nationalities you teach. Yeah. One of the things is that the faculty is as diverse as the students are uh, at the NYU campus, uh, NYU Abu Dhabi campus. Uh, so it's not a question of a missionary you know, kind of attitude. This is just a fact that a university has been set up very self-consciously so the notion that this was set up as some kind of vanity exercise for the international community rather than for the local community, knowing full well that the elite families would send their kids there, I think is a mistaken attitude and a misrepresentation of what NYU Abu Dhabi was. You have to ask yourself that out of all the universities chosen, uh, that they could have chosen from, why they picked what is categorically one of the most liberal universities you know, in many ways, um, and chose to open a liberal arts college, not a science college, not an engineering college, not a business school, but a liberal arts college with a heavy emphasis on humanities, knowing that that would mean that many more Emirati women would take that degree as they do. I don't know what the exact proportion is. So it's not a, it's just a, the way the social cards fall rather than a mission on the part of NYU or the double. Thank you. Uh, Professor Ross, with a question. <laughs> oh, good yeah. Oh, uh, to respond to uh, this question? Both, or if you want to ask a question right now, you could do that as well. Well, it just it struck me when we're talking about the local community, what does that mean? 90% or more of the local community in the UAE are South Asian migrant workers or their families or descendants of them. Some folks have been there for generations and have no rights and can be deported overnight, regardless of how long they've been there. So. I think we need to qualify what it means when we're talking about the, the, the local community there. Um, I, uh, there are a few things I wanted to say in response, however. Am I able to do that? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, on the issue of um, uh, the issue of academic freedom. Academic freedom is not well understood, not even by academics. Uh, it's, it's, not an, it's not an individual right, it's a collective right that's given to the profession as a whole. And when people's individual rights are violated, all of our rights are violated. And uh, there are issues about solidarity there and professional commitment that come. And I didn't hear a lot of sympathy on the other side uh, for, for that particular issue. I agree that academic freedom is not uh, equated with global mobility. Um, although it is equated, at least according to the AUP standards, with um, uh, the right to extramural speech. It's a very important part of academic freedom. And that's something that's severely constrained, I mean, not just in Abu Dhabi, but in this country, not well understood at all, but especially in Shanghai or, um, or the UAE and to some degree in Tel Aviv. I don't see how you can really exercise the right to extramural speech. It's just not protected. And uh, I, I don't feel I really use <coughs> Gothic language. Uh, I thought I used very neoclassical language, but if I, if I was. In fact, I hesitated at one point when I was invoking the, the scenario of these dissidents behind bars because I re really do think, and I don't say this lightly, I say this with the most utmost dread, that there will come a time 
not in, in the far future when one member of the NYU community will end up behind bars. That is on the horizon and we need to be very careful about that. Um, I'll come back to some other issues. All right, could we take a question? Um, Sorry, can I just... Sure, just absolutely. Um, <laughs> I do think that in the way you represented the labor situation in particular, there was a very easy slide between the kinds of abuses that are well documented in the UAE, such as the breaking of the strike on Saudi Island, which had nothing to do with NYU Abu Dhabi. Not true. And you made it... Not true. It is true. I took testimony. I took testimony with my colleagues from the Gulf Labor Coalition in a labor camp in, in Musafar uh, from uh, workers who were engaged on the NYU Abu Dhabi site. Right. This is not in the report, in the Nardella report, it should be said. But we so, took testimony from workers on that site. The one of the issues, so I, since I work on the labor compliance group, one of the issues we've had is very often there have been reports that we have been alerted to where such claims have been made, and the more we've investigated, for instance, there was a report that post the Nardella report there were abuses on the NYU Abu Dhabi campus. This was very troubling. It related to something like 35 workers, and when we investigated, it turns out there was a misconception. They were talking about working on Saudi Arabia, but they were talking about working at the Louvre building site, not at the NYU campus site. So I think one has to be a bit careful. And most, most of what Nardello reported was not to do with this kind of thing at all. It was to do with compensation. I do think that's a misrepresentation uh, of the way the relationship of labor. So I, I think when can, I said... Can I ask you how, how you how you investigated that? Because most of the workers who were involved were deported. Did you, uh, did you locate them in well, the South example, Asia and interrogate them? Well, the example that we are giving, that I'm giving, is actually going to the labor camps and talking to... Yeah, but the they were deported. Right. They were deported. All I'm saying... Some of the members of our coalition actually have done field research in the villages right. in South Asia where they were deported to. Right. So but we have evidence that contradicts this. Professors, I'm going to interject in the favor of an audience <laughs> question. I'm sorry. Gentleman at the back. Hi, uh, I'm an engineering student from NYU Abu Dhabi. And uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Professor Ross, uh, what, like, what is the basis of your statement that you just made about the bars and and <coughs> the faculty or students? About the what? The people put be being put behind bars. That's my prediction. Uh, what do you base this on? Because uh, as far as I know, there hasn't been any NYU affiliated student or faculty that has. No, I said it will. It's only a matter of time before that happens. I know, I hear a lot about uh, uh, folks who, who go to Abu Dhabi and end up behind bars, not out, out of choice. People come and tell me stories about this. Again, not out of choice. I can tell you one example of an academic from the University of Florida who was an engineer and went to Abu Dhabi to attend an engineering conference. He was taking pictures of buildings in Abu Dhabi quite innocently. He obviously took a picture of the wrong building, ended up behind bars for one month, and may still be behind bars if his family were not able to uh, hire a high-priced lawyer to get him out of that situation. There are many stories like this. Excuse me, but I don't think it is uh, relevant for us to be telling stories to each other. And also, I do not think that... Uh, this is evidence. It's not stories. This, this is evidence and testimony. I'm going to move on to the next question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, sir, I just want to sort of raise a point to all the people um, who are criticizing, like, uh, that some people getting reject getting their visas rejected to the United Arab Emirates. Because I'm a Syrian citizen. If I leave this country right now, I'm not allowed to enter again. So therefore, I just want to like keep in mind that um, this is a common thing throughout governments, and it's not like thing that's specific to, to Abu Dhabi, the UAE government. Mm -hmm. Is there a response to that comment? I would also add that I think right now, 99.9% .9 of our students make it. In. There are no visa problems beyond that, as far as I'm aware. The government propositions. Any questions? Any answers? I have a response to it. I mean, I think Sam's already made this, this argument, pointed this out. I mean, if you're looking for folks who are going to defend NYU on the square, uh, you're looking at the wrong people, <laughs> quite frankly. Uh, we've been in the trenches for many, many years here as internal dissidents of the way things are run at NYU. And I can give you chapter and verse on that. But I will say 
that uh, there is a big distinction between going into a joint venture where your partner is a government, which is the case in NYU Abu Dhabi, and in Shanghai for that matter. The Tel Aviv uh, situation is slightly different. They're, they're, we can talk about that if you'd like, I'd be happy to. Uh, but when, when your partner and your paymaster is another government, then uh, there's, there's no daylight there as there is here on the square with the, with the U.S. government. You're not going to find too many supporters, I think, in this room of U.S. government practices. Thank you. Um, gentlemen over here. Hi, uh, I'm Mark Michael. I teach uh, here at NYU in the Middle Eastern Studies program. I've taught at NYU Abu Dhabi for a few years before coming here. Um, and having taught in both institutions, I find uh, the debate on both sides to be quite limited in lots of ways. And the position of moral superiority that a lot of faculty and students tend to take here at NYU New York is, to say the least, very reminiscent of a lot of Orientalist positions that have been used over the years, from the 19th century to this day. Uh, in particular, you know, the notion that NYU Abu Dhabi is a PR um, for the uh, government is uh, not very different from the idea that NYU New York is PR for uh, real estate corporations. It's actually corporate social responsibility for a real estate organization. That's actually my job. I actually help, <coughs> I help the expansion and gentrification of a real estate corporation in this neighborhood. And I'm, I'm really glad to be doing so. But um, I'm doing so at the expense of a lot of students who get into $300,000 of debt in order to get jobs of, that are going to pay them $40,000 a year and they're going to take 20 years to reimburse it. And I know that Professor Ross has campaigned a lot against that, but what I'm saying is that there is no moral position of superiority either on the labor front or on the exploitative NYU debt front, or in fact on the American front and its implication, and all our implication here in eating, for instance, very cheap food through various agribusiness corporations like Monsanto that are displacing and causing mass suicides in India, right? and displacing these workers from their villages into massive mega slums around the subcontinent and, in fact, around the Gulf, reason for which they end up being abused in Abu Dhabi, not because they wish to be, but because they cannot get to Europe or the US or they cannot stay at home because we eat cheap food on their backs. So instead of spending a lot of our time framing the debate over who has moral superiority, whether it is us here at New York or in Abu Dhabi, I think it would be good to understand how both NYU faculty on the square and in Abu Dhabi profit on the back of, and students in fact, profit on the back of these displaced laborers and understand the global flows of capital and transnational flows of capital <coughs> that are creating this situation. Thank you. Are there any remarks on that comment from either side? Seeing none, we will move on to the next question. Are there any other questions? Yes. Uh, this is for Professor Zamir specifically. Um, given that there's been different allegations from both faculty and past students about uh, being denied cl uh, clearance because of their research on labor, and given the recent security clearances that Keshavarzi and, and Bazia said because of their religious affiliation, is there any worry that this could affect the diversity of intellectual thought within the university? So you have many different types of people and many different subjects being taught in the university, but if there is a fear of some sort of retribution or a silencing, self-censoring, does that affect the type of education that people are receiving? Um, so, there are various components to your question. So, I'm not aware of any significant denial of student visas. I think we've managed more or less to, as I said, around 99.9% .9 of students to get through. Um, in relation to the recent two faculty who were denied visas, there is an assumption it was because of their um, uh, work on labor or on the Middle East uh, or on their, due to their religious background, but we have no way of knowing that. Um, the fact, as Louis addressed it, you know, the, we have Shiites um, working among students and faculty on campus. That is. Um, it is also the case that there is no restriction, as far as I'm aware, of anything we teach on campus. So again, although this is hardly an ideal situation, it is possible to be denied a visa to get into NYU Abu Dhabi, but still to teach through video call. In other words, there's no risk, the, the re refusal to let somebody into the country is not a refusal to let them teach in the classroom. Mm -hmm. That's, those are actually slightly different things. I mean, nobody wants that, at least to me, me. But it is, those things are possible. So as far as I'm aware, for the moment, self-censorship has not uh, been a factor at NYU Abu Dhabi. Um, 
we teach courses on gay studies, we teach courses on the Holocaust, we teach courses, we teach some on Rushdie Satanic verses. None of those, and this is publicly known. This is just, again, this is not, nothing is that secret in, in, in the UAE. So uh, that's all I can say. Um, and I wouldn't deny that it is possible that a faculty member could end up in jail, uh, as Andrew uh, uh, predicts, uh, or a student might. Um, it is true that you're not allowed to photograph certain buildings. But in terms of the classroom, I am fairly certain right now, and in terms of most of our research, that the, the notion of self-censorship is uh, probably a red herring. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Mandy. Um, my question is for Professor Ross. And um, I, I, I'm not sure I really understand uh, if I see the context around a lot of what you're saying. So there's really two parts to my statement. Uh, the first one is, you know, I appreciate you taking a stakeholder view of how NYU values was initially come into fruition, um, but none of your arguments ever taken to the perspective of students or alumni or professors. Have you considered within your research taking the perspective of students and understanding from that perspective was NYU a mistake? Because primarily right now it seems focused um, on a few things that were said by outsiders. So I think that perspective would be necessary in your argument. Um, I think another thing is really in balance and the definition or understanding how we answer the question is something of a mistake, right? Because when you answer that question, it's taking the balanced perspective, it's understanding where the pros versus the cons, and I'm not really sure I understood um, the different uh, factors and variables that were in your consideration since it was primarily taken from the perspective of, you know, simply um, is an does the institution offer academic freedom, and of course that's to be disputed, right? But there's many other considerations that must be taken when you're um, considering whether something is a mistake or not. Um, so we'd just love to hear kind of taking other stakeholder perspectives as well as more balanced perspective of the question around is anything in the state? Um, well, I, I thank you for your question. I was uh, interpreting the motion quite specifically. There's a lot that could be said about NYU Abu Dhabi. We could be here for several days. Um, I think the motion deserves to be taken seriously as a proposition, and that's what we're here to debate. Uh, there's a lot that I could say about uh, the work that's being done on the square uh, by the AUP chapter from the very outset on trying to ensure the academic freedom that tenure-track faculty, ascending faculty of tenure-track appointments be instituted at NYU Abu Dhabi and that these fair labor standards be adopted. An enormous amount of work that has gone into that. And of course, uh, academic freedom, as I said, can never be taken for granted. It's, it's widely misinterpreted, and uh, the AUP's job is to, is to push on these issues at every level. And for students, uh, it's particularly important. Um, so everything we've done here on this square, uh, because what happens in Abu Dhabi doesn't stay in Abu Dhabi. It affects all of us. And every time there is a violation of one of our uh, ethical principles, and I think we're all agreed there have been several. Every time that happens, it affects everyone in the NYU community. So we all have a vested interest in making sure that, uh, that NYU's name is restored in that regard. So there's a lot of work that's going on here on the square. And I, don't, I, I take exception to the idea that there's anything morally superior about that work, because this is volunteer work that's being done by students and faculty here on the square on behalf of students and faculty thousands of miles away. And uh, it's consumed a lot of our time and energy, and there's nothing that's moralistic about it whatsoever. It's done in the good name of the university, in a way, to save, uh, to save the administration from uh, falling into an even deeper hole and falling down on the job in ways that they've done over the last 10 years or so. Uh, Professor Samir. I'd like to just address that too. <coughs> I don't know if you noticed that phrase, the amount of work that's being done here on behalf of me and my colleagues yeah, on it's the true. square, it's true. which we do appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Andrew is entirely right that the work that the AUP did and the Labour Coalition did and so on um, significantly helped improve things at NYU Abu Dhabi in terms of tenure and so on. There's no question about that. But actually, despite all the, the, the right framings of this, I've been at NYU Abu Dhabi since 2010, 
and it is very, very, very rare that anyone from the square reaches out to the faculty or the students in Abu Dhabi to ask them what they think. We are also stakeholders in this. There's never been any broad collective discussion with the faculty. No one's been invited, in fact. I was invited at the very last minute for this debate, um, you know, which I'm very glad to be at. But this is, this is a consistent pattern where we've tried to say the faculty need to sit together and have a dialogue and really meet face to face. And although there have been odd individual exchanges, they've been fairly touchy and acrimonious, unfortunately, and not in the spirit in which I think a debate or a discussion should be conducted. There has been, to so give you an example, the recent letter in support of the Middle East uh, uh, Studies Program here from the Middle East Studies Association of America uh, against the denial of the visas. Um, I don't believe anyone reached out to all the members of the Arab Studies Program in NYU Abu Dhabi, all of whom are members of MESA. Um, you know, um, so there's a, there's a real shortfall in terms of dialogue and listening to those stakeholders, including many of whom are in this room. So. Thank you, Professor. We have time for one more question. Um, I will take it from the gentleman back. <laughs> Right, yes. Yeah. <coughs> Hi. Um, um, my question. How many women had asked questions? Why aren't women on the other? I'm sorry. Yes, yes. A yes. couple of things. Um, we did have a woman trying to speak, unfortunately, because of time constraints, we weren't able to do that. So it's not a confident decision on our part. At the same time, it's the questions that I pick and the people who have their hands raised. Uh, I've taken one and I'm just picking them random. Gentleman at the back, please. Yeah, I, I, we will come to you uh, after uh, that, then, Thank you. Gentleman at the back. Yes. Um, my question is for the affirmative, um, and it's something that the opposition said. Uh, if we cannot exist in a society with human rights violations, how can we exist in the United States? Would you please respond to that? Yeah, I can respond to that a little bit. I think the, the biggest distinction that I would, would make is that um, there are a lot of problems in the world. We're addressing this one now. Uh, we're, we're addressing Abu Dhabi now, <laughs> and I don't think we're, we're, we're not going to apologize for um, the United States human rights abuses, and I'm, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, try to, I'm not going to try to make a moral distinction. I won't do it. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that when New York University is paid for, or is not paid for by the United States government, you could say that there are, people have their hand in, in funding the mm -hmm. university, that do not have great interest in mind, but it's not the government. I think another another thing I would say is that actually there are a lot of federal grants supporting this university. Yeah. That's that's sure. correct. Yeah. 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 And they pay yeah. taxes yeah. to the government too. So it's, it's also easy for, for you as a white man to ignore human rights violations in the U.S. When I'm a born U.S. citizen and I can't really ignore Look, those human rights violations. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very oriental discourse. Actually, I'm really disappointed in this panel. Look at your home first before you go and look at other places. But we're, we're discussing NYU Abu Dhabi now, and I would be happy to participate in a, in a different debate on this. I'm not going to apologize for the United States um, in terms of human rights abuses. I won't do it. So I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Thank you. With that, we will conclude <laughs> the session no, and move on to closing rights violations. Speeches. It cannot mean that they're not existing in Abu Dhabi. And I can speak to you right now as a Arab, as a as, as a Muslim. Ma'am, thank you, thank you. We're going to move on to the answer. We'll move on to an open forum at the end of our event. Please. We the room, sure, we will leave the room until a certain time, so we're going to have to move on. Okay. Uh, with that, Professor Zimir, please. Uh, I think I've made most of my concluding remarks. Really, I think it is important. Um, that I used the phrase in my um, opening um, speech that the evidence needs to be passed very carefully. I think in much of this debate, too many things get uh, elided together. The UAE in, with NYU Abu Dhabi, John Sexton with NYU Abu Dhabi, and I'm not from NYU itself. I came into this uh, program um, via NYU Abu Dhabi and I had to learn uh, the hard and slow way in terms of the internal politics of um, uh, NYU. And it's been clear to me, even in, in the debate here, how often the discussion about NYU Abu Dhabi slips into a discussion about John Sexton. That was before my time. I can't comment on that. Uh, I'm basically interested in whatever has been achieved now and whether it is worth sustaining what has been achieved. Sometimes very great things are achieved by slightly kooky visionaries. And in this case, that might well also be the case. Um, and I do think that. The precision of language and not confusing, um, you know, um, 
uh, apples and oranges is very, very important for us scholars in terms of how we think about very precise notions of uh, definitions and evidences and so on. And we should not confuse all of those things. Um, uh, that's it. Saxon described as a cookie visionary. <laughs> <laughs> there, it's true, there are very few faculty you, you could consult here on the square that would agree with that um, characterization. And, um, and the, the legacy is very profound, and it's not, uh, it's not to be dismissed very lightly, I think. And, um, and the motion itself, before as I remind you, the motion is very specific and takes us back to 2007. Whether that was the right question to ask, I don't know. And perhaps I agree with you, it was not the right question to put before, uh, to put before this assembly. Uh, but it is a motion we're, we're asked to, to vote on. Um, I guess one thing I would say um, is that, um, two things, the sanctuary movement uh, has been a huge uh, phenomenon here on NYU campus and probably the most amazing faculty student mobilization um, that we've seen on this campus, uh, at least since I've been here, and that's been more than 20 years. Um, and it has provided a framework for thinking about, not just about uh, human rights violations that the U.S. government is actively generating and engaged in, but it's providing a framework for thinking about the GNU network as a whole and thinking about sanctuary in terms of mobility and uh, the, 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 abol the abolition of discriminatory, discriminatory policies that apply to cross-border movement um, and, and, and related issues that affect all of the sites we've been talking about this evening. And I, and I do hope that you, th that you think yourself into that framework if you can and try and build in the work that the Sanctuary uh, Group is doing. Last thing I will say, I want to go back to the labor issues because it's, I spent most of my time um, doing research and, and, and thinking about those issues. I do think that Professor Zamir, in his opening comments, did give short shrift to the Coalition for Fair Labor's work. Uh, if it was not for that work <coughs> here, the faculty student group, we would not have those fair labor standards, uh, which I agree are the best labor standards in the Gulf. Uh, they're the best regional standards, and we were very proud of the fact that uh, the administration was able to see its way to agree to those standards. So we pushed along with Human Rights Watch early on. However, labor rights on paper is one thing. How you enforce those labor rights is a whole other matter, and that applies in every country. It applies in the U.S where labor rights are simply not enforced because there are not enough inspectors. It applies in China. China's labor rights on paper are wonderful in many regards. They're better than the U.S. They're just not enforced. And that is why uh, I would say that uh, cumulatively, I could say that as a result of all the research we've done, there is no will to enforce those labor policies. Uh, NYU has done a better job than <coughs> almost anywhere else, I agree. Uh, but it's an, it, it, you can't be an island within an island. And if you look at Saudi Arabia Island as a whole, and then if you look at U UAE and Abu Dhabi and the Gulf, uh, the problems are almost insurmountable, and we've seen absolutely no movement in terms of enforcement. So, yes, I, 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 I'm proud of the fact that NYU Abu Dhabi has been a partner in those standards, but the, the lack of enforcement and the lack of <coughs> monitoring which the UAE government will not allow, they will not allow an independent labor monitor to function, and the, the one that we have currently, IMPACT, is not an independent labor monitor, at least by the standards of the profession. We could, we could discuss that and argue about that, but uh, in my opinion, not so. So, let's think about the motion itself and, um, and, and vote for it. <laughs> Thank you. We'll give out the second round of ballots so we can then have your votes after the debate has ended.